Welcome everybody. How's everybody today? We, we are indeed in the final part of our message series and we couldn't leave you guys hanging. Like the level of concern for this poor little pig, did he make it? Some folks were like, I just got to know. So we looked up, man, we went far and wide and we looked to, to meet a pig to see if a pig would actually make it. Check out this video. We did an interview. So many of you have asked the question, do pigs fly? Did that little piggy make it? Let me take a moment and introduce you to a little piggy named Artie. Check out this guy. This is Artie and Artie, do pigs fly? What do you want to tell everybody? Yeah, apparently Artie says pigs do fly and sometimes dreams do come true. <laughs> Miracles happen all the time, guys. So this whole message series was really launched with all of you in mind. So many of us, we beg the question sometimes in our spiritual walk, can God use me? Will I have deliverance? Is healing possible? And sometimes we get a little like frustrated because we pray, we believe, and it seems like sometimes nothing happens. So we develop inevitably in our spirit this kind of approach to spirituality that says, yeah, you know, God does it for others, but when it comes to me, when pigs fly, right? So, so this whole message series is designed to help you guys through that reality to recognize that even though sometimes God doesn't answer prayer the way that you think he is, how does the Bible actually weigh in? What does it really teach about those hard moments in life? And what we're going to talk about today is your calling. So many of us have different views about what it means to be called of God, depending on your Christian background or their lack of. Some of us maybe are newer to faith today, and we're like, well, what is this calling? It means a lot of different things, and Scripture does weigh in on it, and it really defines for us what a calling is, because for some of us, we confuse calling with vocation, and it's like, oh, if I have a calling, that means I have to be a pastor, or I have to be in ministry. Others uh, are taught to believe that a calling is just serving God in any capacities. Others think it's something we do in a vocation, like a job, uh, or something in life we have to fulfill. That one-time big event, that reason why God created you and I. And for a lot of us, it creates like a performance anxiety. Because I will tell you, as long as I've been in ministry, what has been true more times than not is people ask the question, what is my calling? And then we ask the question and they're like, I don't know, can you tell me? And I'm like, I don't know, I'm not God, I didn't create you, right? And, and we go back and forth and we search for this and very often in our lives, we can, we can walk with Jesus completely confused about the purpose of our life. Now, why is that important? Because at the heart of every human being, your heart has asked these questions. These are these deep philosophical questions in life. What's the purpose of my life? Why am I here? Life has to be more than working a nine to five or going to school every day, coming home, doing homework, eating dinner, going to bed, and you recycle it. Like something in us as human beings desires more. And there has to be more. We live our lives in search of more. It's, it's this desire to, to grow and to go up the leadership ladder at work or to get to the next thing, thinking that, man, if we just get there, wherever there is, we're going to accomplish what the purpose of life is. And somehow I'm going to find that fulfillment. But why don't we just take a moment, pause, and let's dive into what Scripture has to say on the topic. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 4 to 9 says this. And this is Paul speaking to the church at Corinth. I always thank my God for you because of his grace given you in Christ Jesus. For in him you have been enriched in every way with all kinds of speech and with knowledge. God thus confirming our testimony about Christ among you. Therefore, do not lack any spiritual gift as you eagerly wait for our Lord Jesus Christ to be revealed. Talking about a second coming, the return of Christ. He will also keep you firm to the end. So God is with us. He strengthens us. He makes it possible so that you will be blameless on the day of our Lord Jesus Christ. Verse 9, lean into this. God is faithful who has called you into, say into, fellowship with his son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. And what we see here is an understanding that scripture says your primary calling, and there's a difference between a primary calling and a secondary calling. Your primary calling as a human being is to discover the truth of God's word, to discover the gospel of peace, and to move from being a, a non-follower to a follower of Christ, to move from death toward life. Our high calling, our primary calling is to be a follower of Jesus. That is the purpose of your life, to worship God, to know God, to live in spirit and in truth, to be empowered by the Holy Spirit for holy living. That is our high calling. And from that high calling, everything else flows out of your life. 
It's like a vase, right, or, or, or a vessel. A vessel in and of itself is empty. It can hold a lot of things, and if you don't fill it with the right things, a vessel will fill up with the wrong things, right? So, so we are made to be vessels where God fills us with, with his spirit, with, you know, Scripture calls it fresh oil, right? And we're to pour out. And what God does with us and the depth of that relationship pours out of our lives into our second calling. So our primary calling is him. It's the relationship with God. Our secondary calling is the things we do in our lives. It's the, it's the overflow of Christ in us where we become maybe like Jesus to others, where we give and we serve and acts of kindness and we fulfill our high calling. When I was a young believer, this was crazy confusing. I was at a church, it was a really good church, but they had a hyper focus on the secondary calling. I never understood as a believer that my primary calling was the depth of my walk with Jesus. And I only believed at that time that it was this thing God was doing in my life. So I lived with a lot of pressure, feeling like I never measured up feeling like I was never going to be good enough, comparing myself to others, thinking, well, I'm never going to be as talented as him or as her. And you live your life feeling like, hey, I'm never going to figure it out. And if I do figure it out, I'm not going to measure up anyway. Sadly, that is a truth that is a truth in a lot of crescendum. In a lot of churches, there's a hyper focus on the secondary calling rather than the primary. And what that causes for us very often is who gets rewarded if the primary focus is a secondary calling? All the extroverts get rewarded. Why? Because they're bubbly and they're outgoing. And who gets rewarded? It's all the people who their talent is visible on the surface. Their gifts, their talents, their abilities, the people that are willing to step forward first, they get rewarded. But it's not on the depth of their soul. It's not on their maturity. It's not on their walk with Christ or, or, or any of that. What, what, it, what it's based upon is how good the box looks on the outside. It's kind of like judging a book by its cover. And if it looks good, it gets rewarded. And what do we see time and time again? When somebody's talents, their gifts, their abilities cause advancement in their life beyond their character and their integrity, we set them up for failure time and time again. We see this all across society. Uh, we see this with ministers that are just like, they're going down like flies over the last couple of years. Have you noticed that? And what ends up happening is their talents, their abilities brought them to these great heights, but their character never caught up. And then it all comes crashing down. The, the reality is human beings weren't meant to be famous. The only one that we celebrate and claim as famous is Jesus, right? I mean, he's the lead pastor of our church. Only his shoulders are broad enough to carry the weight of all of that. Ours are not. But when you advance people beyond their integrity, their talent may take them places. But when their talent takes them places, their character cannot sustain. They always fail and come crashing down. So, so our primary calling, how do we cultivate that? It's about understanding, yes, you're talented. God has given you some things, guys. Yes, God wants to do great and wonderful things in and through your life. But fall in love with the giver of gifts before you fall in love with the gift itself. You worry about the depth of your ministry. What's ministry? It's your life. We're all ministers of the gospel. That's what scripture says. Our society says, well, the minister is the pastor and his staff. That's what society and culture says. That's actually not what the Bible teaches. What the Bible actually teaches is that all of us, the saints, so if you're a follower of Jesus today, lean into this. If you're spiritually seeking, you want to definitely learn this, that every follower of Jesus is a minister of the gospel. And the Holy Spirit blesses each of his children equally, maybe with different gifts, but equally in intensity for the same good, for the same purpose, so that you could live a holy, righteous life made possible by the Holy Spirit. And you're empowered to do supernatural ministry, to fulfill your God-given purpose and potential in this life. So if you worry about the depth of your ministry, God will be responsible for the breadth of your ministry. And that's what we got to recognize. And some of us, we're good with that. We're like, yeah, I love the primary calling because it really doesn't require much of us. The primary calling doesn't feel very scary, right? I mean, it's like we like the idea of Jesus died for my sins. Like, I, There's a price that has to be paid and I don't have to pay it. Like, I really like that, right? You guys like that? You don't have to go to hell. That's good news. Amen? You guys aren't sure this morning? <laughs> like, it's really good news, I promise you. Like, like we like that. And God pursues us relentlessly, even while yet we were still sinners, he chose you and I. And if you're here today and you're not sure what you believe about God, the reality is it's not a mistake you're here. God has chosen to reveal himself to you. We like that. And what we don't like is where it gets uncomfortable. It's really easy to serve God from a place of comfort. It's really uncomfortable to serve God from a place of discomfort. We like to serve God in the known. It's really scary to serve God in the 
unknown, right? Because I don't know if you guys are like me, but I, I like to see what's coming. I like to see what's coming down the pipeline. Why? Because I can prepare for it. The challenge is what's always seductive is walking by sight and not faith. But, but if you always know what's going to happen, then you don't really need God. If you always know what's coming down the pipeline, you don't really need faith. And it's actually a, a need of control we have as people because we want to feel safe. The challenge is our human condition is that so many of us, we fear the unknown. We fear being, I guess, stepping out in faith. I mean, some of us, and I've been at this place in my spiritual journey at different seasons, we get really scared if God calls us to talk to somebody. And we're like, what do I say? How do I share my faith? How do I share my testimony? Some of us get really uncomfortable inviting people to church, right? Uh, I mean, we don't really oftentimes feel empowered to do the things God has called you to do. But this message today, if you open up your heart big and wide for God, I believe the Holy Spirit is going to do something powerful in your life. And he's going to give you the courage and the strength you need to do what God has called you to do in your secondary calling. But remember, we can't lose sight of the primary. And what's required of us? It's a, it's a willing heart. It's a willing spirit. I mean, how many of you would say, make it really personal, would you say, God, my life is yours. Do with me as you will. And that's a surrendered life. It's also a very scary prayer, isn't it? Some of us don't like to pray that prayer because we've seen the discomfort sometimes that it re that's required for us to truly be surrendered to God. It means I give God my hopes, my dreams, my future, my aspirations, and I tell God, do with it as you will. The challenge is, what if his plans are not my plans? What if they're not my plans? And we're not alone. The reality is this reminds me of a gentleman in scripture named Gideon. Gideon, give you a little bit of the backdrop in Judges chapter 6, um, Israel had sinned against the Lord and they were handed over for seven years to the Midianites and invading armies that would come in. And it was so bad that Israel was living up in mountain cliffs and in caves, running for their lives. And whenever the crops would grow, invading armies would come into the valley. They would destroy all the crops. And this is the messed up part, if that wasn't bad enough. They would kill every single animal. They wanted to starve Israel out of the land. Right? I mean, that, that's how bad it was. Times were hard, and people were questioning, where is God in all of this? You ever been at that place in your life where you're like, hey, when, time is, when times are good, man, it makes me feel like God is really with me. But man, it, 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 something happens when times get lean, or life is hard, or my marriage is in trouble, or my finances are in trouble, or whatever trouble it is you're facing, it's like, is God still with me? Is he still with me? because you can't see him with your eyes, and we equate the blessing of God with the presence of God. And we forget that the God of the mountaintop, the blessing, is also the God of the valley. And he says to you in your valley and in your hardship, my grace is sufficient. Is his grace sufficient for you today? So, so Gideon is literally hiding in a wine press, threshing wheat on the threshing floor. He's breaking wheat, and he's doing this hidden afraid that the invading armies are going to come and see him, kill him, and take all the food or destroy it, right? So let's jump into verse 11 of Judges chapter 6. The angel of the Lord came and sat down under the oak in Aphra uh, that belonged to Joash the Abyssalite, where, uh, where his son Gideon was threshing wheat in the winepress to keep from the Midianites. When the angel of the Lord appeared to Gideon, he said, The Lord is with you, mighty warrior. Pardon me, my Lord, Gideon replied. But if the Lord is with us, why has all of this happened to us? Where are all of his wonders that our ancestors told us about when they said, Did not the Lord bring us out of Egypt? But now the Lord has abandoned us and given us into the hands of Midian. The Lord turned to him and said, Go in the strength you have and save Israel from Midian's hands. Am I not sending you? Pardon me, my Lord, Gideon replied, but how can I save Israel? My clan is the weakest in Manasseh, and I am the least in my family. He's having a one pigs fly attitude, isn't he? He's like, I'm nothing. I'm no one. You abandoned us. And, God, and the Lord is saying to him, like, mighty warrior, stand up. I'm sending you. And he's like, yeah, one pigs fly. It's like that moment where you're struggling and you, you call your accountability partner and they're like, man, I'm going to pray with you. God's not going to abandon you. And you're like, my loved one has a terminal cancer diagnosis. I feel pretty abandoned when pigs fly. It's, it's really that moment. Verse 16, the Lord answered, I will be with you and, I, and you will strike down all the Midianites, leaving none of them alive. Gideon is gripped with fear and anxiety. 
And if you struggle with fear and anxiety or even depression today, you know what he's talking about. And if you don't, all you got to do is rewind your tape. I just aged myself a little bit. That was the 90s when we rewinded things. You used to do it with a pencil, you remember? The eraser. You know, if you never have experienced depression and anxiety, it's like that moment of grief. If we, many of us have lost, lost, lost loved ones, and we find ourselves in those deep seasons of deep, dark pain, and, and that's really where he's at, gripped with fear and anxiety. And we have fears of a lot of things. When we think about our secondary calling, you know, we question, will God do that through my life, whatever that is? We have fear of the unknown, fear, fears of our own incompetency. I'm never going to measure up. Man, we got fear of inadequacy disqualification. Some of you can't get past your past. And it's like, I've been disqualified. God can't use me. God can't do anything with me in my life. You don't know where I've been. You don't know what I've done. And then we get intimidated by the talent of other people. And here's something you want to lean into, no matter where you're at in your spiritual walk, no matter how old you are, the challenge is you and I, we practice fear too much. We spend our lives practicing fear. And then one day say, well, now I want to have faith. The problem is we practice fear. I won't, I can't. We grew up in families where we pass down generational sin or cycles or curses, and we tell the kids, oh, no, you can't do that. You know, you need to be more careful. You need to be afraid. Now, I'm not talking about, like, don't play with fire, right? I'm not talking about don't play with traffic. What I'm talking about is those, those, those like, legacies, those lessons, those statements we hand down to our children. And when you have anxious, anxious children, you always have fearful adults. It runs in families because it's trained in families. If you don't like what you see in your kids, your nieces, or your nephews, or your grandchildren, we probably need to look in the mirror and say, well, what have I done to hand this down? What have I? Because we also can hand things down that change all of that. And, and, and then when we want to walk in fear, the Holy Spirit does something powerful in the life of a believer. Scripture says the Holy Spirit comes and abides in us when we become followers of Christ. We become temples of the living God. And one of the, one of the great blessings of the Holy Spirit is he, he pushes away fear and darkness and gives us courage to do God's will. And yet the cycle and the pattern continues in our lives. What we've practiced all our lives doesn't, unless God does a miracle, it doesn't just disappear in your life when you say yes to Jesus because you've practiced fear your whole life. What if we stop practicing fear for the rest of our lives and we practice faith, faith instead? Scripture says that no word God has ever said fails. So what does that mean if I believe that? It means I'm going to lean into everything God has said about me. You're going to lean into everything God has said about you. Some of you felt disqualified because of your past. And when you become a child of God, he calls you son and daughter. Well, I'm a, I'm a son of the living God. I may have not felt like somebody very valuable in my family of origin or when your friend circles, but man, I am the apple of God's eye. I'm going to repeat that over and over and over to myself. Man, Scripture says to walk by faith and not by sight. Man, I'm going to walk by faith. I'm going to repeat that over and over and over. Understand what you practice over and over, you make permanent in your life. And it's not about positive thinking. In and of itself, positive thinking does nothing. But what we're talking about is when your thinking is reinforcing God's truth in your life, the power comes from the source of who said it. And that's what we practice over and over. And that's what we have to teach the generations. And that's what discipleship is. Scripture says to grab every thought, grab it. That's, that, that's a verb, right? You're doing something. To take it captive. Like I'm putting handcuffs on that thought. You no longer have power in my life. And then to make it obedient to Christ. Well, what does that mean? I'm grabbing the lie of the enemy. Remember, listen to this. Everything you believe that is not scripturally based is inspired by the evil one. Every negative statement about you, about your calling, about your future, about your relationship with God that is contrary to scripture is inspired by the evil one. Scripture says to take that captive, really to enslave it and force obedience to Christ, which means I identify it, I reject it, and I replace it with a biblical truth. I may have had negative statements said about me, but this is what God's word says about me. I am not who they say I am. Understand, you choose who your appraiser is. You do. And if, 
Many times we are our worst critics, aren't we? And you've got to ask yourself, the put-downs that you have given toward yourself, as, Midi, as Gideon did, he learned those from somewhere. Whose voice is in your head? I promise you it's not your own. Every negative statement that you give yourself, you got to beg the question, who said this to me first? Where did I realize that this is something that I might repeat to myself and hold on to in my life? And that's where you realize that this whole time was inspired by the evil one in your life. You see, your past and your current position, it's not your liability anymore in Christ. It demonstrates the power of, of God and the testimony of the Lord. God still takes broken things today and he makes beauty out of them, doesn't he? Scripture says that uh, he chose the foolish things of the world to shame the wise, the weak things in the world to shame the strong. I love this, Ephesians 2, 8, 10, one of my favorite scriptures of all time. For it is by grace you have been saved through faith. And it is not from yourselves, it is a gift from God. Primary calling, first thing that happened. And then verse 10, for we are God's handiwork. I don't know what you believe about yourself, but you are the handiwork of God. You're not a mistake. You're not an accident. You weren't a, oops, my parents had a baby. You were chosen by God. You were destined for this moment in history. You are God's handiwork created in Christ Jesus to do what? Good work which God has prepared for you in advance, which means from the creation of the world, God intended you to discover him. And, and it's not like we just kind of find God by accident. Jesus, some people are like, oh, I found Jesus. And I'm like, yo, G when, when was he lost? Jesus was not lost. It was us, right? So it's not something you find by happenstance. The Holy Spirit, one of his revealed ministries that you and I see in Scripture is that the Holy Spirit woos men and women toward God through this thing called conviction. What is conviction? It's not about feeling bad about your sins. That's a lot of times what we learn in church. It's, it's actually a false, uh, a false understanding of the word. It simply means in the original language to be convinced. And what am I being convinced of through the wooing of the Spirit? That in and of myself, I'm not enough. That in and of myself, I'm a sinner. In Scripture very much so teaches that there could be no sin in the face of a holy God. And the wages of sin is death, the payment to sin, to appease God's wrath, his holiness, his righteousness, his judgment. It has to be paid. And Jesus paid that on your behalf and mine when we place our faith in Christ. And in response, we become the righteousness and the holiness of God so that God can raise you up to discover him through the Holy Spirit and then empower you to live a life that is honorable to God through the Holy Spirit. He's, he's got work for us to do. So we're saved for a reason. We're saved by grace, through faith, for works. By grace, through faith, for works. And the beauty is we're chosen in our weakness. I, I was talking to one of our leaders the other day, and she tells me, she goes, Pastor, you know, I just, I can't believe what God has called me to be part of. It's been nothing short of amazing. God had placed things on my heart so many years ago, and I had all these dreams and aspirations of how they would play out, but now I see them happening in the ministry I'm serving. Look what God has done. And, and she's a, a younger person, and I encouraged her, and then she says, I can't believe it. I sit in circles with other leaders who are like twice older than me, right? Moses started ministry at 80, so y'all ain't old, don't worry. Amen, right? And she says, but I feel so unqualified. And then I looked at her, I said, so who's qualified? Who's qualified to serve God? Only the one without sin. That's Jesus. That's the, that's the gospel, right? We become the righteousness of God as if we lived his life. So God, lean into this. Man, God goes after the unqualified. He calls the unqualified, and then he qualifies the called. It's not the other way around. When you have a calling, God qualifies you, God builds you up, God prepares you through the Holy Spirit, the edification of the church, and you are released to do the work God has called you to do. You have a calling on your life. Primary calling is what? Follow Jesus, right? The secondary calling is the works that flow out of that in your life. The challenge is we can't see it. Some of you are jammed up like Gideon because you can't see past your past. You can't, and you're holding on to it. Remember what he said, pardon me, my Lord. Gideon replied, how can I save Israel? My clan is the weakest in Manasseh. My family is messed up. How many of us come from messed up families, amen? Sorry, mom and dad, I know you guys are here, but we, we ain't all that and a bag of chips, I'll tell you. 
my clan is the weakest. My family, they don't have it going on. Man, and, and we are the, and my clan is the weak, the weakest, the least in all of Israel. You see, here's the habit that we have, and this is the deception of the enemy. We learn to maximize, say maximize, all the things about ourselves we don't like. It's all we see because we, what we practice, we make permanent. And we minimize all of the things God sees, all the things that he placed in us. Scripture says man looks at the outside and God looks at the, the heart, right? We have to be able to see past our own criticism. And when we don't see past our own criticism, that's where rationalization sets into our life. What's rationalization? It's when we make excuses for why what ought to be happening isn't happening. I can't. I won't. How could God use me? I've disqualified myself. When pigs fly. And we go our lives, our whole lives, hungering and thirsting for something more, but always settling for something less because we can't see past our past. And, and what you have to be able to do, and where God is going to take Gideon, is you got to be able to move from what was to what is, what God is doing in your life. We have to move away from what the enemy has uh, inspired and done in your life to what God wants to do in your life. And it's really interesting what, what happens next. Verse 12, when the Lord appeared to Gideon, the Lord said, I am with you, mighty warrior. Like this guy, did he look like a mighty warrior? No, he's hiding in a wine press, afraid of what's going to happen next if he gets found out. But what is God doing? He's calling out something in Gideon Gideon did not see within himself, something God placed in him. I promise you this. Hold on to this today. God has placed things inside of you that you have minimized. And as long as you minimize it, you're never going to walk in the fullness of what God has for you. Maybe we just need to pray, God, give me eyes to see. Give me eyes to see. You know, some of you are like, oh, pastor's good. He preaches every Sunday. Public speaking's hard, but not for him. Let me tell you, everybody's afraid all the time. I get anxiety before I preach almost every single week. And my wife lovingly comes over, puts a hand on my shoulder and prays for me. Man, when she first saw me public speak, I met Joe Marie in seventh grade. I thought she was the most beautiful girl in the world. I did. I still do, honey. And I was terrified. The teacher did the worst thing ever. She says, you guys got a group project, and you're all going to public speak. So I had to stand up in front of the class. And I used to have gel on. I had my hair kind of parted, 1990s style, I think it was, late 80s, 90s, right, whatever it was. And, um, man, I was shaking like a leaf. And then I heard the, 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 the comments, he's shaking a now, you know, when they said that, that wasn't helpful. I started to shake more. And then I'm talking like this, and I, I'm holding my hair, and my hand's shaking, and I pulled a clump of hair out of my head and didn't even know it. And then I heard, oh, he pulled a clump of hair out of his head. And I was like, oh, my gosh, they all saw this. I wanted to die. I wanted to die. I never wanted to come back to school again. I realized at that moment I had lost any hope of her dating me for at least a few months. I had to get my, my it factor back, right? And, um, man, it was hard. And, and this guy, that, that's where he's at. And it's in those moments when we kind of listen to those comments, give in to those experiences, that we, we actually co-sign our own negativity. And then we're like, God, yeah, I know you've said that about me, God, but it just doesn't penetrate deep. Because what we practice, we make permanent. We make permanent, permanent absolutely. But yet our heart and our desire is for more. And we sense it. And we go through our lives wanting to be part of something greater, wanting to be part of something bigger, believing God wants to do some great things. And, and, and as we think about that, we, a little bit of us gets excited. We get excited deep down inside. But the closer we get to it, we get afraid and we run. You know how many people I've seen sign up for different ministries to serve events and then the day of, they don't show up? They don't show up. And I'm like, you know, is everything okay? What happened? Oh, I, I went and I turned around. You know how many people come to church on Sunday and they don't actually enter the building until the fourth visit because they've, they've driven here, they've sat in the parking lot, and they drove away. Those might be extreme cases, but th that's, like a, that, that's like a little case study of what happens deep in all of us. And we've all played with fire, right? Yeah, don't tell security, okay? We've all played with fire as kids, right? Now, y'all can see that. You can hear that, and that's terrifying. And don't play with fire, by the way, kids, right? And we've all done this. And it doesn't hurt. It doesn't hurt. Why? Because we can tolerate it just enough. But if we leave it there, 
It's not gonna stay very long because it's super, super hot. And that's what happens to us in our lives. When we, when we experience this desire that God has placed in you, no one else has, has placed that in you, that hope of more, that hope of life, that hope of being part of something greater and bigger. Nobody placed that in you but God. And the enemy only allows you to tolerate just a little bit of it until something happens in your life. It's something that we have to be able to say yes to. And it's that moment we see in Scripture where men and women of God were filled with something more. We saw in that moment with Peter, right? They're they're going from one side over the Sea of Galilee to the other to do ministry, and Jesus is on a mountain praying, and these dudes are in a boat, and they're in the storm of their life, and the storm is raging, and they're they're white-knuckling it. I mean, these guys are holding on for their life. And they're like, Jesus, where is he? We need him here now. And then all of a sudden, Jesus is walking out to them on the water, and they see him, and rather than going, oh, look, it's Jesus, they're like, oh, no, it's a ghost. This is really bad, right? We thought we were going to die, and now there's a ghost, right? I mean, that's terrible. (laughs) And then one of them realizes, wait a minute, it's Jesus. And then in that moment, all fear gets pushed aside. And Peter, he's got his eyes focused on Jesus. And he says, I see you. And some of you have been in these moments in your life where God has felt so clear to you, and you are all in. And he gets out of the boat and he says, Jesus, if it's you, may I walk towards you, Lord? And Jesus says, come. And his eyes were set on Christ. And as long as his eyes were set on his primary calling, he was walking on water until he realized he was walking on water. And then he looks to the left, I imagine. Waves are huge and I feel the water and the wind just hitting me. And the moment he took his eyes off of Christ, he began to sink. Hope entered him, and he was doing something supernatural. The moment hope left him, not that Jesus left, but his focus, he started to sink again in his life. Reminds me when Jesus ascended into heaven after resurrection. What did Jesus say to the apostles? Man, don't don't you guys run. Don't you leave Jerusalem. Why? Because it was just 40 days earlier Jesus was alive, Jesus died, and they all scattered like lost sheep because they were filled with fear and anxiety. And this is what Jesus says to him right before he ascended. Do not leave Jerusalem, but wait for the gift my father has promised. Say gift. Which you have heard me speak about. For John baptized with water, but in a few days you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. Then they gathered around him and asked, Lord, are you at this time going to restore the kingdom of Israel? He said to them, It is not for you to know the time or the date the Father has set by his own authority, but you will receive, say receive, Receive. power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and Judea, Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. Like, you will receive power when you are filled with the Holy Spirit. And what do we do as believers to push out fear? It's not that the feeling of fear ever leaves. Understand this, fear is a part of life. Even Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane was like, Father, take this cup from me, but let your will be done. Faith pushes through fear. You may have fear, but fear was never meant to have you. The Holy Spirit lives in the hearts of believers. And when the Holy Spirit fills you, he gives you access to the capacity to say, I'm going to walk by faith, not by sight. I'm going to fulfill God's call for my life. I'm going to be courageous. I'm going to witness. It's not to say they never had fear again, but they were able to have strength and power over it. And what gets in the way for you and I very often as believers, is really our focus. Do we go back to old habits, old patterns, old behaviors? Because when life gets hard, we beg the question, where is God? Holy Spirit fills you so that you could fulfill the calling to do the work God has prepared for you in advance. And you got to ask yourself this question if you're a follower of God. What has God given me the power to do? What has God given me the power to do that I have been ignoring? What is something Jesus has been calling you to pay attention to in your life? What has he been asking you to step out in faith and do? Is it an apology for something you did wrong? Is it resolving conflict in your life? Is it serving more? Is it standing up and sharing the hope that Jesus has given you more? Like whatever that is, the reality is every single one of us has an area of our life, a room in our hearts that we've been like, God, you can have all this, but don't go in there. That's the messy draw. How many of you got a messy draw in your kitchen? Amen? 
All the guys are like here, and the wives are like, no, don't do that. <laughs> like, we got a messy draw spiritually. And until you give God access to that draw in your life, you're never going to walk in the freedom God has for you. Because as long as that draw, draw is there, we're like Gideon. And this is, this is him struggling still with circumstances. The angel of the Lord came to him, said, mighty warrior, God is with you. And he's like, pardon me, my Lord. Verse 13 replied, Gideon, but if the Lord is with us, why has all of this happened to us? Where are all of your wonders that our ancestors told us about when they said, did not the Lord bring us out of Egypt? But now the Lord has abandoned us. Before he said that to the angel, how many times has he practiced that nonsense in his life over and over and over and over? You got to ask yourself, Holy Spirit, would you minister to me right now? What is it that I've been practicing that has brought death into my life instead of life? Like, take out your phones, write this down in your notes. Like, have a moment with God. Holy Spirit, what have I been practicing that has led me to destruction, that has led me to self-hatred, pain in my life? But now the Lord has abandoned us and given us into the hand of Midian. If God is with us, why are things so hard? That's the moment. And this is an interesting response of, of the Lord. The Lord turned to him and said, go in the strength you have. Man, I would have been a little salty right here, right? I would have been like, I'm asking you for help. And you're like, go in the strength you have? Like, I don't have it. And save Israel out of Midian's hand. Am I not sending you? You see, you might be the answer that you've been praying for. It's not you in your own strength. Let's just clarify that. It's what God has placed inside of you. And some of us have spiritual apathy. We want, God, would you give me this breakthrough? But I'm going to sit on the sideline in the bench and not be part of it. Give God something to bless, guys. Sow a seed of faith and say, God, I'm going to take a risk. I'm, gonna, I, I'm, I'm not, I'm not going to leave it off the table, this thing you've been wanting to deal with in my life. I'm going to give it to you. I'm going to walk by faith and trust that you're going to do something with it. Mighty warrior, what has God placed in your hands? What does God see in you you don't see in yourself? Open up your hands. Look at these empty palms. We go to God. This is why we lift our hands. Some people have asked, right? They're like, why during worship do we lift our hands? There's a lot of reasons for that. But, but I think one of the more commonly held understandings of that is simply this. We raise our hands in reverence and worship to the Lord because I come to God empty-handed, waiting to receive. I don't bring anything to God that he needs but I need to receive from him. So I, I, I raise these empty hands in, in a, really in a position of humility. God, would you fill me? And you gotta look at your hands and say, God, what have you placed in these hands that I've been ignoring in my life? Take a moment. I mean, really, I hope to God you don't walk out of this service today without hearing a word from the Lord. Like, God, what did you place in these hands? Right, we maximize the negative, minimize the positive. Man, you might be a sick baker. You know, God has given you the ability to cook. Who are you cooking for? Like, do I give to the hungry and the homeless? I know pastor has a chocolate chip addiction. Did I feed him lately? <laughs> like, I got a little extra time in my life. I got extra time. I'm going to sign up for the next impact ministry. Man, I, I, do you have a pamphlet? Real quick, sure. can I grab that? I mean, you guys are going to open up this pamphlet we got five days of service. We're going to be honoring first responders one day. We're going to be partnering with Habitat for Humanity on Tuesday. We're going to be giving out breakfast vouchers to people coming into local restaurants. With, and all of this happens with an invite to our church barbecue that Saturday. Why? Because we want to fill their hearts with Jesus. We're going to be doing, partnering with a, a food drive, um, giving out Dunkin' Donuts coffee. We're doing a bagel outreach. We're going to be doing a Ice cream outreach? Who wants to go to that one, amen? Right? We're going to be feeding dinner to the needy in Poughkeepsie with hope on a mission. And then on Saturday, we're going to be having almost the most amazing, probably barbecue slash carnival event in the Hudson Valley. And the community is going to come. And, and what did God call us to do as a church? To meet their needs. You see, you are God's plan A. Say plan A. You are God's plan A to be a blessing to the world around you. So what do I do with this? Let's really, as we wind down this message, where do we go with this? Because the Gideon's story ended with this. He trusted God and he built an army. 
but he had too many men. And God stripped that army down to like 300. The real 300, right? There's a movie out there, but it's like the legit story, right? And the army they were facing were tens of thousands. Some scholars say over 100,000. There is no possible way he could have had victory. So what did he do? He grabbed his company of 300. He broke it up into groups of 100. They went to the hilltop with trumpets, and they started breaking things, and they gave a holler to, to the Lord, and God caused the invading army to become confused, and they destroyed themselves. You see, when our focus is us, the outcome is always when pigs fly. But when our focus is on God, we always see that God prevails. What focuses me? When pigs fly. Failure is what I see. When our focus is God, we always see God's strength prevail. So how do you make this real in your life? Well, two things. I think, one, God, what have I, what have I pushed off the table that you want to deal with in my life or you want me to do? I need to say yes to that. You need to go deeper in your walk with the Lord. Remember, you worry about the depth of your ministry. God's going to worry about the breadth of it. And then the, the next one's really important. Scripture says God's desire is to fill you with his Holy Spirit. Now, we know that that happens at the moment of salvation. But the Holy Spirit has these amazing gifts. Go, go home and read this. Romans 12, Ephesians 6, 1 Corinthians 12. Gifts so that you could edify the body of believers and, and God's will for God's kingdom will be done here on earth. He wants to work with you, partner with you. And the only thing you bring to the table is a willing heart. And all we have to say, Scripture says, seek the Spirit. Seek the gifts of the Spirit. It means to desire deeply to chase after. Well, how do we do that? Simply ask, Holy Spirit, would you give me gifts? Holy Spirit, would you give me whatever gift is your heart's desire so that I can fulfill what you have called me to fulfill in my life, so that I can give you glory, honor, and praise? And I want to encourage you before you leave today, we're going to have people up here praying in just a moment for you. If you want the Holy Spirit to bless you, be part of your life, give your life to Jesus. Come up and do that. If you want the Holy Spirit to bless you with gifts, our people are here to pray with you. But there's no power in the people. It's in the one we seek. You could sit in your chair and say, I'm not going to them, God. I'm just going straight to you. Jesus, would you give me gifts so that I could fulfill your purpose in my life? And he's faithful and just to do that. I want to take a moment. I want to pray with you guys as we're winding down right now. God's going to do great things, but you got to want it. you got to believe it. you got to desire it, and you got to ask. Let's pray. Father God, in the name of Jesus, Lord God, would you fill us, God, supernaturally with your Holy Spirit in ways that we could have never imagined. Holy Spirit, some of us have spiritual gifts, and I pray that those gifts would grow. Others, Lord God, have not identified a gift in our life yet, but we desire that. Would you bless us with that, Jesus? Lord God, and more importantly, we got to focus on the depth of ministry. Jesus, would you, would you help us to fall more, more in love with you, God? Would you be the greatest desire of our heart? Would you be our greatest want? Lord God, may we hunger and thirst for you, Jesus, more than we do for the air we breathe. May we chase after you, God, with the same zeal and effort that we put into chasing other things. But yet, may we do it more. Lord God, would you bless your people and bless our families this morning, God. May we go home as a new creation, Jesus, filled with your spirit to do what you have called us to do. Thank you, God, for calling us in our weakness. That's the miracle, that you would partner with broken men and women and you would restore us and bring hope. We celebrate you today, King Jesus. We thank you, God, in your name, Christ Jesus. Amen.